thanks everybody for coming. I know it's been a, a busy conference and we're probably all getting conference fatigue and you know, I was a little nervous because I'm following Brad Schoenfeld and he tends to fill rooms and go over time. So he did get out in time so we can get started. Um, when we start looking at this, uh, it's, it's a real big honor for me to do the Mike Stone talk. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Mike Stone was my mentor. Um, but more than a mentor, he's a really good friend of mine and he was my coach. He trained me for a very, very long time as a weightlifter and you know we just missed the Olympics several times. So um, yeah, that's the sad part. We really wanted to do that. But he did teach me about science. So it was always an informative session. We would train together and lift and, and do that part. But in the middle and rest sets, he'd get up on a whiteboard and start teaching me science. So it was an awesome learning experience. And we started playing with this idea of cluster sets back in 1993 because he decided he wanted a new way to beat me up in the training room because um, that was what he did. He experimented on me. Um, and it was kind of interesting. And, and any one of his students will tell you that's what he does. He experiments on you, um, his new theories. And um, it was an interesting experience. But where can we start framework-wise with the idea of cluster sets? Well, I think we have to start with traditional sets. We have to understand what's going on physiologically. And, and one of the principles of Mike Stone is that we've got to understand physiology to understand how the body adapts. If we don't understand physiology, we're not sure what we're training the athlete to do. So we're really making physiological adaptations. So when we look at this, we know that in as little as five to nine maximal contractions, we're gonna have a reduction in maximal force capacity. We're also gonna see a reduction in rate of force development. So we basically lo are looking at a fatigue response. When we get that fatigue response, we know that as the number of repetitions increases, we see a decrease in movement velocity. And as we know, we, Dr. Dan Baker did a talk uh, this week on velocity-based training, and a lot of people are looking at velocity as a marker of fatigue or performance decline. So we know this happens in a traditional set. Well, we know that power output can go down. We know that maximal force will fluctuate depending on how we may, uh, are performing the set structure. The other thing that we look at in general is that higher volume sets, we're gonna start to see uh, greater declines in things. So if I were to try to do a set of 30 snatches, we're gonna see a massive reduction in velocity compared to two repetitions. So we kind of know this, and I think this is where we have to put on our athlete or coach hat. We know this, we see this in the weight room. So now when we're scientists, we're gonna look at this to see why is this happening, and maybe is it a good thing for it to happen? It may be, or is it a bad thing for it to happen? It may be depending on how we're programming. Now, one of the things that we can look at, and I really love this paper by Gristaga from Spain. It's a wonderful paper on the actual physiological responses that underpin uh, sets of 10 and sets of five. If we look at this really closely, what we can see here is that we have a set of five, and here's our power output. It stays pretty steady. I mean, we have some fluctuations, but it's not a rapid decline. When we look here, we see the sets of 10. We see a rapid decline here towards the end. Why? Because we can't move the barbell as fast. So power output goes down. So we have a distinct difference between sets of 10 and sets of five. Now, the sets of five are done about 85%. The sets of 10 are at a 10 RM. Okay? So we see this pattern that we would expect from a traditional set. We look more closely, what's going on? So let's look at the physiology. This study was great because they did biopsies, pre, post in these conditions. When we start to think about this, we can see that we see an increase in ATP turnover. Makes sense, we need to make energy. We've gotta keep those contractions going. We also see an increase in ATP production from the phosphagen system. So phosphocreatin's being converted, we're using it, we're breaking down to make ATP. So we're using that phosphagen system and it's gonna become fatigued eventually. Why does creatine supplementation work? Because we can make our, a greater availability of phosphocreatine. The other thing we can look at is that we're gonna to start to see an increase in glycogen utilization. My dissertation at the University of Kansas was actually on glycogen metabolism in response to resistance training. I can tell you that if you're on like a 20 gram carbohydrate diet, your performance as a strength power athlete will go down in the weight room. Why? Because depending on the volume of your training, the greater your glycogenolytic effect. In fact, three sets of 10, you can get about 30% reduction in glycogen in your vastus lateralis. That's a large amount of glycogen for an athlete like a weightlifter who may train twice a day or a football player who may lift in the morning and run in the afternoon. So that's a big uh, carbohydrate draw that we're gonna have to go after. We can also get an increase in lactate release depending on the loading and the structure of the set. Ultimately, if we think about things really closely, let's take a look here on this figure here. Phosphagens we see we use about 9.2 with one to five reps. And as we move up to the 10 reps, 
we see an increase. So if we do uh, two, uh, break at five, so five reps and then five reps, we can see 9.2, 3.5. If we do straight set of 10, 1. Uh, 126. So that phosphagen system is more engaged with that bigger repetition set. Now, the other thing we can look at is the glycogen metabolism. A again, greater glycogen metabolism with a longer set. Now, one of the things that we have to think about then is, is this beneficial to have this fatigue develop? You know, we do a big set, we have a lot of fatigue. Maybe if we're trying to develop strength or hypertrophy, this might be beneficial. We might be, if we're trying to develop power, maybe not. So if we look at this very closely, here's three, uh, basically 50 repetitions. So we have five sets of 10. The bottom here is the traditional set. Look at the power output, goes down, comes back after they rest, goes back down, comes back after they rest, goes back down. The traditional pattern that we would see. Why is the, uh, the power going down? Most likely it's the velocity that's declining. We're not able to keep the barbell moving as quickly as we did when we were fresh. Now, if we look at sets of five, so two sets of five, we could see five, pretty steady power output, pretty steady power output. Across those 50 reps, hmm, pretty steady power output. We're maintaining power output across 50 total repetitions because we're doing smaller chunks. So when we look at this, this is two examples of how the velocity power relationship may change depending on the volume of the set structure. So this gives us some ideas about some things that are going on. So let's take a look at some physiology that explains some of the things that are going on here a little bit more closely. So the first thing that we can look at is ATP. You know, one of Mike Stone's classic jokes is that Indians live in ATP. Um, he says it and he said it, and those of you who have studied with him have known you've heard this one. Um, and he also says very clearly that the only time you deplete ATP is the day you die. So, um, and that's one of his common jokes that he has, and he has many. And he usually does it with a pair of spandex and a belt on after he's done his squats. Now, <laughs> you laugh. Those of you that have studied with Mike know that he stops class to go have squats. Um, and it's a very big deal to him. Now, one of the things that we can look at here is these this biopsy stuff. We know that the metabolic demand of that set structure is gonna cause a reduction in ATP, a reduction in PCR, and an uh, increase in lactic acid concentration, and a decrease in glycogen. Now, the magnitude of these declines are related to the volume of the training structure and the weight that you're lifting. Volume load is probably the best way to quantify volume, so that's reps times sets times intensity um, at this point. We don't have a better method. Hopefully in the future our technologies will get better. We know that this reduction in ATP here, so this is your uh, five rep. See how ATP is pretty steady. It goes down a little bit across this five rep set. Look at the difference with 10. So here's that five, 10, very, uh, at that time point. So we're looking at big reductions in ATP, but not complete depletion. Remember, we don't get to eat complete depletion until we die. Now, PCR, we're gonna see a change in PCR as well. We see here, this is a set of five, a little bit of reduction, but you know, pretty much maintained. Why? Because we can buffer phosphocreatine with uh, creatine shuttles and to use oxidative metabolism and recovery to get phosphocreatine restored. But when we have a longer set of 10, what, look what happens. We see a reduction in phosphocreatine. This is why creatine supplementation works. I remember the first study that Mike Stone did on phosphocreatine. Pilot subject number one, 30 grams a day for 42 days. I was a good friend to the bathroom. I had to go to the bathroom a lot because creatine just, when you overload it, it just goes right out and makes inspective urine. And then he figured out what to do. Now, the other thing we can look at is creatine. Creatine here, we have, uh, here's a, the creatine response for sets of 10, sets of five. Exactly what we'd expect from our knowledge of bioenergetics. I'm a big fan that bioenergetics explains a lot of things that we, we do in the weight room as far as energy demand. And we've got to always remember that when we make decisions. This is why when I work with professional rugby players and they say they're on the banting diet, I scratch my head and go, well, you're not going to make it through a rugby game because you don't have enough glycogen. And that's a big problem for us in Australia at the moment. Now, one of the things that we can also look at is the relationship between the peak power decline and the ATP decline. And we can see there's a linear relationship. As our percent of ATP of initial value goes down, our percent decline, excuse me, yeah, percent decrease goes up, our percent decline of power output is linear related. So we're looking at, we're decreasing uh, ATP more, 
our ability to make rapid contractions go down. So we don't have the energy to do the things that we want to do. So with decreases in AP, ATP, there's a reduction in the ability to maintain the velocity of movement. If you're a fan or you're someone who's following the velocity training concept, there's this idea that maintaining velocity in training is important at certain times during a training year. So this becomes an issue for us. Now, we can also look at the uh, peak power output's relationship to muscle lactate. Remember, this is a biopsy study. We've taken muscle out of the body. We've looked at lactate. So when we see an increase in lactate concentration, we see a reduction of peak power output. Traditionally, lactic acid was considered a fatiguing compound. It's not really, it's really not. It's something that we can move into another energetic system to make ATP from through shuttles. But we do see this parabolic relationship. A lot of lactic acid, we don't, make, we don't move as quickly. Why? Because the body's like trying to slow down and make energy from other sources and buffer off that lactic acid. So we have to think about that when we start to look at cluster sets. So from a physiological standpoint, what we see is that the longer the set, the greater the volume, the more the decline in velocity, power, and what's probably related to that is energetic supply, specifically ATP, phosphocreatine, and the buildup of lactic acid. For the training session, glycogen becomes more important. Now, when we start to think about this even more closely, there's a neuromuscular response. And there's not a lot of literature right now looking at EMG responses that, uh, to uh, traditional sets versus other set structures. There, just, there needs to be a lot more work done in this area. And this is some work from Joy that shows that a traditional set, as we move through the repetitions, the muscle activation goes up. If we were to break it into two sets of five, we see it uh, uh, up, up again. So we're not getting that activation from fatigue that we typically would see if we're going to failure. Okay? Now, when we start to think about this even further, we can look at some seminal work from Hakkinen's group, and I'm a big K.O. Hakkinen fan. I had the privilege of getting to know him, and I remember talking to Doc Stone after I did. They're like alike, a lot. Um, Hakkinen came to our lab, and he came in, and he pulled out his Olympic lifting shoes and says, when do we clean? And I was like, do you hang out with Mike Stone? Because that's a statement he would say. Um, but Hakkinen's lab is very interesting, and it's, if you are not someone who's read Hakkinen's classic work from the 80s, you should, because it's some of the seminal work in weightlifting, specifically the sport of, but it's a lot of physiological work done on uh, strength training that a lot of people have forgotten about. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's not good, guys. Just because you haven't seen a digital copy of it doesn't mean it's good. Uh, bad, excuse me, it's, or good. You want to take a look at the older literature. So the first thing that we can see is that there's a change in isometric force production with the number of sets and repetitions as they go up. The more sets and reps you do, uh, the more reduction you see in isometric force over time. So you're looking at a fatigue response. If we look at EMG, we see that same pattern very similar to what other people have seen. Many, many sets, we start to get fatigued and we can't activate muscle to create contractions. Kind of makes sense if you think about it. So with traditional sets, we see an energetic response. We see a muscle activation response that's indicative of fatigue. But we also can see technical breakdown. So when we start to look at some data, and this is from Jeff McBride's lab uh, at Appalachian State, what you see is the more repetitions you do, the more changes you see in the mechanics of lifting. This is uh, from a power clean. So if I was to do um, a set of, in this example, is a set of six, there's a difference from rep one to rep six in the, the S-shaped curve of weightlifting. Those of you that work in the weightlifting sphere know there's an efficiency related to this curve. The bigger the loops at the top, the more inefficient you are in your lifting patterns. The, the tighter they are, the more efficient. So what we see with fatigue, those looping portions of the curve become more deviant, and that is indicative of fatigue-induced technical breakdown. So this study is the only one that I know of that's ever been done to look at this. And there really needs to be more done with extended sets out, we're talking 10, 15, 20, to actually show this technical breakdown. Um, weightlifting coaches know this innately. They know that if their lifters snatch for 10, they start to see a technical breakdown. That's why if you look at the IWF manual, they don't really recommend more than four or five repetitions because of that technical breakdown. Then you start practicing bad technique, basically. So we have to think about that as we look forward. So one of the things that we can see here is in weightlifting movements, this is very, very clear. I don't know if it's the same in squatting motions or pulling deriv derivatives at this point, because no one's actually looked at it in the literature. 
I would guess that it would be. So when we look at these structures, and, and I remember when Mike started to talk about this when we were grad students, we said, well, we know these responses happen, but sometimes we need to get high volume training. Well, if, if you know Mike Stone and his theories, uh, sets of 10 are a big part of his training. He likes people to do sets of 10 periodically throughout the year as Olympic weightlifters. And some people in the weightlifting community are like, eh, that's a little strange. Um, but it really does give a great benefit. And in fact, our great Olympic uh, lifter, Kendrick Ferris, third Olympic Games, does 10s periodically throughout the year. And if you, have, if you want to see an impressive video, he did something like 250 kilos recently for sets of 10, weighing 94 kilos. That's beastly. Uh, that's a big weight. So when we start to think about, OK, we do need to do some higher volumes, but is there a way we can modify the set to allow us to maintain performance across each repetition? With the theory of, if I can optimize the repetition efficiency, that may be beneficial for me. The second thing we could look at, could we maximize across many sets? Or more importantly, could we change the physiological stress, thus changing the adaptive response? So when we think about this, all of this may underpin our technical efficiency. If I could do a lot of reps, I can do them efficiently, I could get a big training adaptation. So we started to think about it, and what, what do you do when you're, when you're a scientist when you start to ask a question? Where's the first place you go? The literature, right? You start to look at the science. So Mike pulled out this paper by Fred Roll and Jay Omer. Those of us who've been around a while know these are some of the icons of strength and conditioning in the organization. They wrote a wonderful paper about two-lane football in 1987 in Strength and Conditioning Journal. And one of the things that was interesting is in their study, they indicated that clusters are used during strength and strength power phases of a periodized training plan. Clusters. Okay, what's a cluster? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. They talked about it doing sets of two to six reps with a load of two to six RM with 20 to 30 seconds rest between each repetition. So do a rep, wait 20 seconds, do a rep, wait 20 seconds. Interesting. Theoretically, what might, might that do? A small amount of recovery, perform. Small amount of recovery, perform. And that was the first notion in our literature over here in the NSCA that you can see this. Really a fascinating paper. Just so you know, 2 to 6 RM is roughly about 83 to 95% of 1 RM, depending which conversion table you use and exercise you make. So, you dig a little deeper, and you know, we're giving an award tonight to Dr. Yuri Verkashansky, who's, you know, in my mind, one of the greatest sports scientists of all time. Well, in his book, Super Training with Mel Sif, and it actually is referencing a paper that was done in Russia back in the 60s, um, another form of interval training that requires one to perform one or more repetitions with a 10 to 20 second interval between each repetition or clusters of repetition in an extended set characteristically, the minimum load is one's 5RM and four to six repetitions are performed. Seems a lot similar, pretty similar to Omer and Fred Roll's paper that was published in the NSCA. So he's like the first real definition of cluster sets that I've been able to find. There's other people that have suggested there are others, but I haven't been able to locate it. He also broke it down even further. Extensive sets involve four to six repetitions with one's four to six RM with 10 seconds, so shortening the, the rep, rest re, in between repetitions uh, between each cluster. And then he talked about intensive, where the intensity was higher. So in the extensive, he's using 83 to 90%. He may use above 90% of 1RM in these uh, intensive clusters. Involve four to six sets of only one repetition with 75 to 90% of 1RM with about 20 seconds. So when it's intensive, you have a longer rest. Why? The longer rest, more recovery, higher loads. Conceptually, that makes sense for those of you that lift weights on a regular basis. Now, if we look further, how do we define, in my lab, cluster sets? And I think there's a lot of debate right now on what a cluster set is. And we could get into a real philosophical debate about it, and we can get quite fired up about it. But for us, this is how we think about it. A cluster set is a set in which there is 14 to 45 seconds between individual repetitions or groups of repetitions. So that's our base definition that we work from. We have some subtypes that Mike Stone defined back in the 90s of undulating. I actually wanted to call it pyramid because undulating to me suggests up and down. Really, this is a pyramid, up, down, within a set. 
So you're going to increase the resistance across the set and then come down at the back end. Okay? An ascending set is just increasing every rep. So lift, put more weight on, lift, put more weight on, lift, put more one weight on to increase the load. We'll show you some examples at, towards the end of the talk so you can visualize what we're talking about. Now, another structure that are often referred to as clusters in the literature are extended sets. This is where a very long set is created from might be th maybe three traditional sets. So let's say I'm going to do 30 reps, three sets of 10. Well, three sets of 10 would be the traditional way, right, to get you know, our volume. This would be 30 total reps, and we do two reps, break, two reps, break, two reps, break, until we hit 15 total clusters of two. That's a different way of looking at it. In our lab, we call that an extended set, not so much a cluster set. It's a subtype of the cluster set in our mind. Now, the rest-pause method is classic in bodybuilding, where you do as many reps as you can till you fatigue, rest a few seconds, do as many as you can. That's kind of referred to as a cluster set as well. I actually think these two definitions actually confuse the cluster literature a little bit from the way that we conceive it. Doesn't mean it's wrong, it's just the way we perceive it. Now, graphically, this is what we are kind of playing with. We've got three sets of five repetitions, two minutes rest in between, your classic strength kind of training day. A cluster set where we do five by one, so when I do a five and a slash one, that means we're gonna do one rep, rest, one rep, rest. Kind of how we define it when we write the program for our athletes. So I've got five repetitions here, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, but here's the key. Two minutes are between each set. In our mindset, in, this, in Stone's mindset, when he started to think about cluster sets, he said the rest stays the same between the sets. Fundamentally, what does this do? Increase the total rest in the set structure so that you can have a higher quality training session. So most, uh, we can modify this format in many ways, but this is the base paradigm. Does it make sense to everybody so far? Okay. Now, traditionally cluster sets are used to attack two problems, velocity and power. We use them to improve our power output or our velocity of training. Power is kind of on the downswing right now. Uh, people are really switching away from power as a measure. Impulse is a much better measure. But I will say at this point, there's no research that has really defined impulse in a cluster set structure. We need to look at this more closely. So we're going to look at this in relation to power and velocity and how cluster sets may impact both power and velocity. If you think about it, velocity underpins power, really. So it's really a velocity concept. So in 2003, we actually had did a study, but I want to say that the plan for this study was actually uh, determined in 1999-98. Mike Stone actually called a bunch of researchers from around the country and said, come to Boone, North Carolina for a weekend. So Kyle Pierce came in, I came in, another guy named Lon Kilgore came in, and we spent the whole weekend trying to figure out how to do a training study, uh, a short study to look at cluster sets. So you had all these guys that flew in, and we're all lifters, so we're all testing ourselves, basically. And one of the things that we came up with is a three-study design. So we had a traditional set structure, perform five reps at 90% of 1RM, of your power clean. We we're going to do pulls. Okay, remember, you generally in the sport of weightlifting, use a percentage of your full lift in your pulling motions. Okay? And then we did five repetitions at 120%. And a lot of people are like, 120%? You should be able to pull more than you clean. Okay? And then if you look at the Russian literature, optimal velocity for pulling motions is somewhere between 90 and 110% okay, of your lifting motions. And that was done by Frolov, in the, and it's published in the Soviet Sport Review. We look at cluster sets, five repetitions, 90, 1RM, so we're going to put a 30-second rest in between each repetition. And then we did the same with 120 with the same repetition rest. Then we did the undulating. So the average of the set was 90% of 1RM. So we started low, up, down, but the whole average of li uh, kilograms lifted was 90% of your 1RM. We did the same with 120%. So when we finalized the data, you could see very clearly the undulating set, the velocity drops off and comes back up. In fact, we actually believe that that undulating set creates a PAP effect in the back end. And we've, we're starting to explore that a little bit more as of late. If we look at our traditional set, you can see it goes down in almost a linear fashion. If we went out to 10, it would probably continue to go down for velocity. 
as we would expect from what we talked about previously. If we look at the cluster set, we can see here, it goes down. Everybody's excited on the first rep usually. They pull pretty fast in pulling motions. We're seeing a different response in squats, actually. And then it flattens out and stays pretty steady. So we're looking at this basic pattern of velocity responses. And this was actually done in 120%. I use the 120% because that's where the most significant differences were found, because the load's quite high. So that got us thinking, how could we modify that basic uh, concept in a different way? So we looked here. So we started to look at using different rest intervals. So 20 seconds with rest, uh, six repetitions across for three sets with that steady two minute rest interval. We then looked at clusters of two. We don't always have to do one rep. We could actually do multiple reps and have some rest and maybe get a different physiological response. Or we could do three. So the, the creativity as a coach that I could have is quite great because I could change the number of reps depending on what I'm trying to accomplish with the training program. If I'm purely working power, I could do singles. Or if I want to work on strength, I might do a few, bit, uh, a few more repetitions. So we've got a little bit of plasticity in the way we design the training program. There are many complex structures that can be created. There's a very few researchers in the world right now doing cluster set. I know John Oliver's doing it at Texas Christian University because we collaborate with him. Um, we're doing it at Edith Cowan University, and that's about it. There's not much more. There's some Spanish guys doing it, Soler, but he's doing mostly rest-pause method. So there's some things that need to be done in the literature to really understand. Classically, Hansen uh, with John Cronin did some work with the uh, squat jump, and what they did was they looked at a steady weight of 40 kilograms. They did clusters of one, uh, four total sets, a traditional set, clusters of one with 12 seconds in between, clusters of two with 30 seconds after every two reps, three reps, clusters of 60, uh, with a 60 second rest, and they did a total of four sets. What they did here is they equalized all the rest intervals. We actually don't think that from a scientific perspective this is really good, it's control, right? But from a practical standpoint in the weight room, we'd never do it this way. We don't train this way. You don't equalize all your rest intervals for your whole training session. As a strength coach, if I'm working in, you know, at you know, Notre Dame with uh, the football team, I don't have time to equalize all the rest intervals for the whole team. There's a hundred and something of them. So I've got to look at some of the things here uh, with my coaching hat and my scientific hat. One of the things that's interesting is we actually think equalizing the time may have changed the responsiveness of the data. So if we look closely at this, so we've got basically four groups. We've got a traditional set. Look what's happened, uh, the percent change from repetition one. Uh, for uh, power output, we see a decline. Uh, for velocity, we see a similar decline. If we look at clusters of one, we can see it's pretty steady across. Clusters of two, we see a little bit more decline. And clusters of three, a little bit more decline of both power and velocity. Power is underpinned by velocity changes. So the more reps you do, the more de uh, decline you're going to have, the less reps, probably the less decline in your clusters. And that makes sense to us from a fatigue management perspective. Now, if we look at another uh, set of data from that study, we can also look at peak force. This data is just all over the place to me. Um, our recent research is not showing some of these declines in force. You know, the force is staying pretty steady. But you can see here there's some variable responses to the force uh, output over the repetitions. So, it may affect our ability to keep that barbell moving because of the changes in the force profile. Because it's a jump squat, it's a little bit different story, so to speak. We're looking at pure squats right now, and that's a little bit less ballistic, obviously. So one of the things that we can think about here is that uh, cluster one demonstrated the greatest maintenance of velocity, force, and power output. So one rep, rest, one rep, rest. But if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense just intuitively. Now, why would that be effective? We can look at uh, some great work from Solon and Wren. Now, this is not in cluster set literature, but it's in force production isometric uh, testing. So what we can see here, it takes about 15 seconds in reco to recover peak force to about 79% of your original value. It's pretty good. You get a pretty quick re return. We looked at our cluster sets, what we say? Somewhere between 15 and 35, 40. So we should be able to get pretty close to about 80, 85% return. 
Why will that, uh, what will happen there is we'll see an ATP PCR resynthesis to give us the energetic supply to be able to make that force production happen. So shorter rest intervals create more, a reduced ability to recover and change the physiological response, right? Shorter rest intervals, more endurance oriented. Longer rest intervals, more power velocity related. So that kind of makes sense to you if you understand your bioenergetics, you kind of train, and you kind of think about it intuitively. The science is just kind of catching up with coaches. My wife, who's probably one of the best coaches I know, says this is, yeah, duh, science. Um, and and she will, if she were here, she'd probably get up and say that because um, she does it every one of my talks. Now, and, and we go back to the work from Jeff McBride's lab with Travis Triplett and Hardy. We can see very clearly that if we do a traditional set, look what happens to velocity. If we change the rest interval to 20, second, um, 20 seconds, we see a decline. If we put it at 40, it stays pretty consistent. So what does this data tell us? We can manipulate not only the number of repetitions in the cluster to get a physiological response and performance response, we can manipulate the rest interval. <coughs> so that gives us as a coach a lot of ability to make changes to how we give a stimulus to the athlete. Now we can look over here and we can see the same basic pattern uh, for power output. For me, I'm actually starting not to report power output because everything seems to be underpinned by velocity. And you're just getting the basic same picture as the velocity graph. Now, how does this work over multiple sets? Because we don't traditionally do one set. I mean, it's pretty clear that multiple sets are better than one set for performance and adaptation. So we can see that if we look at that traditional set structure, we're going to go down, go down, go down. So we have that repetitive pattern. Two minute break, we come back, we recover, do it again. We look at the 20 second, we're going to have a little bit less decline across the three sets. 40 seconds of maintenance across. So we can keep velocity and power output very high. And we can see that again here in our peak power data. It's at virtually, I mean, I actually asked Jeff, I said, is this the same graph as the velocity? Because it's almost identical, okay? So if it is identical, that means force is probably maintained across all those repetitions. Now, the other part of the data from Hardy is look at the difference in the, in the force curves uh, versus the ones we showed you before for the traditional set. Look at the curves. They're very similar after the total number of repetitions that are completed versus the first repetition. As where the traditional set, we started to see big deviations in those curves. So we are able to maintain our technical proficiency across the set structures. Now, as we look forward, well, could this also be used to look at hypertrophy? Could I lift more load more times and get more time under tension? Because time under tension may be related to hypertrophy. Could I get more stimulus to get muscle growth? And we have that, that's our question right now. My, my doctoral student, James Tufano, did a presentation this morning in, in the research uh, presentations about his work. Um, and he's interested in this, this concept. So I'm going to present a lot, of, some of his data that he might have presented a little bit this morning, but to kind of show some data about hypertrophy in cluster sets. We're not sure. We're still looking into it. We're looking at the mechanical factors. A training study is sorely needed to kind of look at this even further. John Oliver's done a little bit of work in this area, but we want to look at it in a little bit different way. So how might cluster sets impact strength and power endurance or hypertrophy? So could we do really high volume set structures with cluster sets? We could create higher repetition sets greater than six with various cluster models, and we can increase metabolic stress and potentially overall workload. So it's kind of similar to the interval model, high intensity interval model that Verkashansky talked about way back in the 1960s. If we use weightlifting derivatives, and I'm a big fan of using weightlifting derivatives at different points of the training cycle to get the adaptations we want, and one, uh, one of the things we can look at is could we maintain technique? And potentially, theoretically, we should be able to and get a different response. So if we look at it even further, well, what if we did our set structure like this. So both of these set structures have 70% of 1RM, and this is from John Oliver's work, and we do multiple sets over time. What might happen here? Well, well, look at our patterns. We could see here that our concentric time under tension goes up with our tens, goes up kind of with our cluster set. So there's not, it kind of goes against our intuitive nature. Why wouldn't the cluster set go up in, in, in uh, time under tension? We're not lifting a heavier load. The load's equalized. 
if we did a cluster set, theoretically, should we be able to lift a higher load? Yeah, right? Because we're clustering it. And that's the next place that we'll go. And we can look over here at a different uh, response here in our, uh, let's see, what's that one? Uh, in our, uh, gosh, my eyes are bad today. Sorry, guys. In our velocity. So we could see our velocity decline with our traditional set, and we have that response with our cluster sets. So when we start to think about this even further, so it appears we can make a couple things. What exercises should we use in our cluster sets? Well, most of the literature right now is on explosive power exercises, weightlifting derivatives, weightlifting movements, and squats. That's pretty much the stuff that's been tested at this point, and jump squats, excuse me. What sets and repetition schemes could we use to create cluster sets? There's a lot of different ways we can do this. And it's going to be dictated probably by where you are in your periodized training plan. The next one is, how do we manipulate the rest interval? Again, what are we trying to accomplish physiologically? Excuse me. So what I would say to you guys, as you design your cluster set structures and use them, you want to basically get yourself designed in a certain way to allow you to get the physiological adaptations you want. What types of uh, cluster sets can you use? What load do you use? How do you integrate it into your periodized plan? And where do various cluster set structures go? Well, theoretically, this is where we operate right now. We have what we call our strength, power, endurance, or hypertrophy, uh, strength, power, endurance zone, power, clean, power, snatch, clean, pulls, snatch, pulls, push, press, bench, press. Hypertrophy, back, front, squat, uh, incline, press, bench, press. We might be able to pull pulls over here. Uh, strength, power, focus, again, the Olympic lifts, their derivatives, uh, power, focus, jump, squat, snatch, and clean, bench, press, throw, push, jerk. So the exercises are more power oriented. Now, we can look at our set structures, one to five. We could say as a general recommendation, um, eight to 12 reps for the uh, strength, power, endurance, four to six reps for the hypertrophy, or yeah, for the hypertrophy uh, reps per set, uh, four to six reps per set for the strength, power, two to six reps for uh, the power. I'd probably go uh, six to 10 there, that's a typo. Apologize for that. So how would we load it? We have a table that we use. So if I want to, we could do it a couple ways. One, let's say I wanted to create a heavy cluster set. I could say, all right, I'm going to do clusters of two. I could do 86 to 89% of my, of my 1RM, or 2RM, excuse me. Or excuse me, 1RM, sorry. Which is roughly 90 to 94% of my 1RM. Or 90, excuse me, I have that backwards. 90 to 94% of my uh, sets of two. 86 to 89% of my 1RM. I could then look at it and basically grade that load to the number of reps that I'm doing in the cluster. So if I want to do a cluster set of four and I wanted it to be very, uh, heavy again, I would use, again, 90 to 94% of the 4RM, which is roughly 81 to 85% of your 1RM. Okay, see how we do that? And it's right out of Mike Stone's 1987 book, which is a seminal book in my mind, Weight, weight Training a Scientific Approach. So we could look at it this way. As the number of repetitions increase within the cluster, it becomes more uh, a focus. Uh, we have to increase the rest interval so that we can focus on power. If we focus on endurance, we shorten the rest interval. So that's the first thing that we would, would say, right? More rest, more power, less rest, more endurance. If we look here, we could say, all right, how would that work? Five to 15 seconds for strength, power, endurance, hypertrophy. 20 to 25 for strength power, 30 to 40 for power, and that gives us a structure to work from there. And increased recovery time between clusters, again, becomes more power oriented. Now, how can we actually create a set structure? I won't go through this in complete detail. Standard would be, let's say I want to do uh, six sets. We could, uh, we could basically go 91 kilos over two, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 total repetitions. And that would be basically our structure. So and that would roughly come out to 65% of 1RM for a big volume set. We could undulate it, and this is just an example. We're going to do 10, reps, 10 total reps, 85 by 2, 90 by 2, 95 by 2, 95 by 2, 90 by 2, 85 by 2. And that comes out roughly at 64% again. And we could manipulate the rest interval as such. From a power focus, we could do the same, but just make a shorter set structure. So this could be 102, 102, 102, 102, 102 for one rep, 25 seconds, 85 percent. 
Again, the undulating would come up and go down. Ascending would be just increasing weight each rep. So the athlete lifts, during the rest adds weight, lifts, adds weight, lifts. How would we put this into a training program? We could go a traditional set for our power snatch warm up, clean grip shrugs for a traditional set, then power cleans, undulating cluster, 130, 134, 138, 133, 130, with a rest interval of 30 seconds between each repetition. So you can see we're getting higher loads, we're, multi we're manipulating the loads, and I could tell you that Mike used to do this with me all the time in my clean workouts, and he'd have me do something like 160, 165, 170 with 10 seconds in between each one. That was brutal. You had to focus really hard to get that accomplished. We could also do it with speed squats, power uh, cleans, and jerks, and you could see ascending clusters, 115, 120, 125, 120, 125, 130, 125, 130, 135. So then we move forward. Now, the yearly training plan, this is from Fred Roll and um, uh, Jay Omer's paper. We could see they put it at certain phases of the summer program. Towards the end, right before the season started, they put the cluster sets in to bring performance up. This is a real good theoretical model from strength coaches in the field, but no one's actually done a science study to actually test it. I think it's probably valid because I know those two guys pretty well and they're really good strength coaches. They wouldn't have done it if they didn't think it would work. Us scientists need to go uh, look at it a little bit more closely. Now, one of the things you have to do in life is, as a scientist or a strength coach, you don't do things in isolation. People impact your life in, in many ways. I was lucky. I met, actually, Dr. Andy Fry introduced me to Mike Stone in 1992. And I got, it was a really surreal moment. He took me and we, he introduced me to Bill Kramer, John Garhammer, Mike Stone, and Kyle Pierce. And I was like this little snot-nosed grad student, like uh, undergrad, like, oh my, these guys are big time. And Mike and I kind of hit it off back in the 90s. Um, I got to train with him and spend a lot of time with him. And he kind of changed my direction in life. I wanted to be a strength coach. That's what I wanted to do. And I love strength coaching. But he got me so intrigued with asking why. Why do we do what we do? And ever since then, I've been on this journey to become more knowledgeable about strength training. I, don't, I know about that much. I think Mike knows like about that much. Um, at least that's what he tells me. Um, when I look at this, it's really surreal to me because at the time in 1994, he was the president of NSCA around that time. And at the NSCA offices, his picture is right above my picture as president. And I thought that was a real interesting overlay. Well, Mike changed my life. I want to thank him publicly for uh, giving me a chance when a lot of other people wouldn't. And, you know, the most important collaborator I have is my wife. She's amazing. Um, and I have a lot of other friends out there that I do great work with all around the world. And my grad students, they're the ones that do the hard work. They're the ones in the lab while I'm flying around, you know, representing the NSCA. So that's the conclusion of my talk. I think I'm right on time or pretty darn close. If anybody has any questions, I'll gladly answer them. <laughs>